All this is Dr. Mobin Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So thank you very much for being here. I hope you had a great weekend. This study is concerning. Uh, what is interesting is they don't know how what happens or why does it happen. But from the images, they know that there is deterioration, one. And now the second question is, okay, there is deterioration. Others also have it. It is faster than others or a little more than others. Does it matter? And then they are saying that the cognitive decline, the functional outcome is also observable. That is uh, kind of uh, concerning. So Doug says, was this only seen in those with anosmia or similar symptoms? They think it is because of anosmia or hyposmia, but I don't think that they have the complete um, anosmia history from these patients. Very good question. I actually had following questions of my own. Number one, did they confirm that they were all anosmia patients? One, although they saw all the olfactory pathways affected, so it is possible that the patient actually doesn't have anosmia, but still the olfactory nerve is involved. Just like tinnitus is also a very common problem with this. And so olfactory pathway, I'm going to draw it out because I saw a question that how does olfactory nerve, just this sense of smell does all of this. So I'll draw it out and explain it. So that was one question. The second question I had was, did they see... I mean, they were looking at people's images and then in between they were looking at their infection history. Did they see vaccination history? Did they, did they see vaccination occurring just like infection occurring? And did they see any such change? Yes or no. I mean, I'm not saying they should go and say vaccinated get that as well. My point is it will be interesting to see that data too. And then third data point that was, in my opinion, was interesting and is not there is vaccinated and infected or infected and vaccinated? How does that work? And of course, the fourth one was, will it go away? Will it recover? And they said that we don't know. So that is, uh... <laughs> Dr. Z, welcome. Have you seen the new like button response? Yeah, that is so nice. You just hit it once <laughs> don't hit it more than once okay or odd times okay so there was another question um i think that was girl interrupted her question was that how come olfactory nerve so let me show some of that connections so i'm going to share my screen and see if i can find a picture. Actually, if you give me a second, I'm going to show it to you on BioDigital on 3D Anatomy. I was going to do this as a separate discussion, but let's just look at it here as well. So if I go to Anatomy, And then if I remove, let's say, cardiovascular system, connective system, muscular system, and if I let's set up this little person here to help. So we take that out. So now let's see. Reproductive system, urinary system, respiratory system. I'm going to leave skeleton in this. I'll take the endocrine out as well. Okay, so here we have a this person. I'm going to first remove the frontal bone here. So if I remove this, now we have this part of the brain that is above the eyes. This is the orbitofrontal area this part. It of course has, if we look at the brain like this from front, it has this lateral side and a medial side and then there is an inferior side as well here. So these are 
all part of the orbitofrontal brain. This part of the brain is responsible for executive function. Now, let's look at the olfactory nerves connections. So you can actually see the olfactory bulb here, but let's go through the nose. So here, if I take this bone and remove it, then we are, sorry. So now we are in the nose and here, here you can see the olfactory bulb here. This is in the roof of the nose. Good. This. Now we are going to trace the olfactory bulb all the way. So I'm going to try to remove eye. So left eye removed. I'm going to remove parotid as well, uh, lacrimal, parotid, <laughs> lacrimal. This is the eye area. Very good, Mubeen. <laughs> <laughs> but rotate in the lacrimal area. Oh, all right. So now here is what we're seeing. This part here, this is the olfactory bulb. And if you see here, olfactory bulb is then, this is olfactory bulb. This is in the roof of the nose. It has, it sends small tiny fibers that go in the roof of the nose. Nose behind this is the olfactory path. So I'm going to now remove some more of the bones and brain tissue to show us that. So I'm going to remove this bone and this bone and this bone. So really this part, this part of the temporal, sorry, the temporal tissue inside, deep inside are the tissues that are connected with the olfactory. So I'm actually going to remove them, these guys. This is the white matter here. I'm going to remove that too. So we can go deeper and see. So this is the olfactory path, correct? And it is connecting. I'm trying to see. Need to remove some more things. Let me remove this guy, this guy, this guy. And now this is the ventricular system. This whole thing is the ventricular system. This is the insula, another part. I'm going to remove this as well. And now we can see a lot of, I'm going to remove this too. This is actually orbital gyrus. These are the tissues that, this is the tissue that participates in the olfactory connections in the personality area. So I'm going to remove this. And now you can actually see a lot of the connections. So for example, this is the olfactory path. If we go along the olfactory path, near the, if you see it converts into, it divides into three basic structures. One is the lateral stria, the other one is the medial stria, and then there is a tubercle. I don't see the tubercle here, but this is the septal nucleus. So here, amygdala. So this amygdala and the things that I have removed, all of them together here, they're Around here is also the parahippocampus tissue, uh, hippocampal tissue, then the uh, midbrain structures. I believe this is the cingulate gyrus. So this is corpus callosum. Just above that should be cingulate. This is the sing cingulate gyrus. So they saw that cingulate gyrus gets affected as well because it is part of the limbic system and that in, in turn is part of the, connected with the olfactory system too. So this olfactory nerve, when it connects into all of those brain tissues, and if the olfactory nerve brings in infection, it would go to those areas. Or if it brings in inflammatory mo uh, molecules, it will go to those areas. Or if it causes, it doesn't function correctly, and that absence of function or reduced function is, imagine these, these tissues that are responsive are sitting there saying, okay, olfactory nerve, send me some signals. I want to work. 
an olfactory nerve is sending no signal and they would start degenerating or they would start uh, disuse atrophy. So they would try, start becoming atrophied. This is what is happening. And a lot of the brain tissues are actually connected. And this is the cerebellum. So they saw that cerebellum is also involved. This is the parotid gland that I was seeing in the lacrimal area. So this is this is cerebellum. They saw changes in the cerebellum as well. They saw changes in the um, piriform cortex, which is in this area too. This area that you're seeing is mostly around the limbic system area, emotion area, and auditory system, visual system, and especially olfactory and taste system provide a lot of input here. So I can further draw it to help with this. So now let's see. So this was one question from the girl interrupted that just one nerve. So yes, because that nerve, olfactory nerve has a special role, just like vagus nerve has a role. And that is olfaction is connected with food, which is a very important part of our life. Without food, we'll die. So we food is connected here flavor, then sex, emotional re responses. You have seen that for the mating uh, processes in, in animals, the olfaction is a very important part. So olfaction is a special sense and it is connected in many parts of the brain. Okay, so... Um, This is, Casey, this is a good question. Are there any studies to support the use of magnesium uh, 308 for COVID brain? I do not know. So if they are there, I have not yet looked at them. So I can't say yes or no. Nath Natasha says, when I got COVID, I felt like my brain was wet. This, this, um, it causes tinnitus as well, internal ear infection too, middle ear issues too. That's an interesting question. Diversity Love says, could you go through how anemia is diagnosed? You know that diagnosis of anemia or the anemia can be diagnosed easily. The diagnosis of the cause of anemia is such a huge topic and so many even doctors are challenged by that and students for sure so i on the dr bean there is a set of lectures done by one of our uh, hematology oncology uh, specialist about anemia and i would do as well So Duncan video says, I love how much fun doctor has in his lectures. Really helps with the breaking up the stream of information. It doesn't get burdensome. Thank you very much. Okay, so. <laughs> this is just weird. We are looking at the out the back of his head. So um, back of the head is here. If I remove the occipital bone, this bone, this is the back of the head. The this part, this part, the cerebellum, and this occipital lobe, they are in the posterior cranial fossa. So I. If I can draw on this, if I say draw, could I draw? So our brain sits in, I'm going to do a rough diagram before anatomy people capture me and say, what the heck? Our brain sits in the skull structured like this. So we have a anterior cranial fossa, then we have a middle cranial fossa, and then we have a I don't have an undo, so, so this is what you got, posterior cranial fossa. So not anatomically exact, but 
that is what uh, we have. So let me clear this. Let me actually show you the skull. If I go in here and I say complete anatomy. And then if I remove everything except skeletal system, then we can see skull. So if I go into this skull, let's say we remove this and remove parietal bones and we kind of look into the skull oh man controls are just weird so here this is a posterior cranial fossa this is the middle cranial fossa and then there is an anterior cranial fossa as well the these are the places where various structures are present so we were talking about the structures that Start from here, go in here, present in here, and above the eyes. That is what we were working with uh, here, above the eye space. Do, do you see this? Uh, Ah oh, man, I hate this. In Do you see this little uh, bone with this uh, holes in it? This is this is part of the ethmoid bone, and this is making the the upper part. This part is making the roof of the nose, and these holes are this part of the bone is called cribriform plate. Cribriform plate. Cribriform means it has holes in it, like a um, like a filter. And so the, <coughs> excuse me, olfactory bulb sits on top of it and then it sends little branches that pass through the cribriform plate and then they enter the nose where then these get exposed to the environmental molecules. So here, this is the cribriform plate. And if I go further, in here, do you see these little things? So, so from there, the nerve comes in. So we are inside the nose now. So the nerves comes in and the nerve has its little uh, branches hanging down and they are supported by the epithelium here. And the odors or odory form molecules or odory generating mo molecules are here and they connect with these nerves and uh, nerve branches and that's how the whole thing starts. Okay, so <laughs> all right, so these were so Amanda says, is it true that regressive autism could be an autoimmune condition of the brain, chronically inflamed microglia cell leading to the neuronal damage? It is possible, I haven't yet heard that uh, or seen that study, but in here, the authors postulated that it is possible that the microglial cells are involved as well. Prancer says, my neurologist actually told me that I have a good looking brain. I thought that was so funny. Yes, that is correct, but it is actually very important that we have a good looking brain. V says, just show us Luffy. Luffy is out. So he, because of his grounding, he goes out when I'm teaching 
and then by the time I'm done teaching, then he comes back and then he is in the home. So I'll I'll get him once more. So Bob says, when you had the skull up, I think I can see the ear bone. So the ear structure, if I open this up, here is the is the ear canal. And then inside here are the auditory systems. Pituitary sits in this place. And optic chiasm occurs here, pituitary is here. And our body is a fantastic thing. Such complex um, thing. Learned the learn and the zukunft Andrea says, sorry, <laughs> I'm very concerned. So that would lead to a human race and race end up with damaged brains. So I was talking with someone. This is more of a high level discussion other than the medical. I was talking with someone that it seems like with the virus or in certain cases with the vaccine, we are ending up, this whole generation is ending up with some scars. And that could be this part as well. That could be so many other issues too. Okay, so this is a good question. Only duffel bag says, reduction of gray or white matter. So let's talk about that. I wanted to kind of um, share how does, what does this mean? So, <clears throat> first, let me go here. I have in my library, I have this diagram. So, if you see here, these more orangey kind of colors are gray matter, and inside is the white matter. What does this really mean? So, let's see. So keep this in your mind, and I'm going to draw it. So what happens is, imagine there are neuron cell bodies, right? So these are all cell bodies. Neuron has a structure that it has cell body. Normally, a cell is just this one little rounded or some structure is a cell. Uh, and it has, not exactly, they're always rounded. Some are flat, and some are tall, and some have hair, and all that. But Normally, this is how we say this is a cell. In the case of a neuron, the cell is not just this much. We have dendrites that receive incoming signals, and we have exon that bring in outgoing sig signals. Within the brain, when neurons communicate with each other, one neuron's exon ends on the other neuron's dendrite. So if this was another neuron and it had its own dendrites, then it has its, its exon. So this is a synaptic junction, we call it. And this is where the end of one exon is meeting the dendrite of the other neuron. And that is how impulse travels. And you would see that impulse travels in electric form here. And then when it reaches this part, here it becomes chemical substance dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, acetylcholine, and so on, 5-hydroxytryptamine. Um, so then that molecules go and they, they stimulate things on the other neuron, and then that neuron starts having electrical activity. So there is electrical activity, then electrical activity converts into chemical, then back to electrical. Sometimes the, the neuron ends up on a muscle, for example, or we call it effector cell. So effector cell ne doesn't necessarily have to have electrical activity of the same sort. It would do something with the electrical activity, for example, contract or secrete and stuff like that. So now the white, gray matter is actually the neuron cell bodies. When those bodies come out of the neurons, they make these collections or bundles. And these bundles of threads are covered with myelin sheath, so they look white. So if I go back here, 
these orangey things have neuron cell bodies and these cell bodies exons or the nerves coming out of them are making these bundles so really these bundles are no separate things they are actually part of the gray matter neuron cell bodies now the researchers looked at the thickness of the gray matter so what they did was they said that let's say This is the tissue, and this tissue is made up of a lot of neuron cell bodies, and that is the thickness of it. And then from these cell bodies, if I make blue in color, these are the fibers that are coming out of it, right? So these make the um, white matter. Now this gray matter, this gray matter, they can measure the thickness with the imaging of these gray matters. And that is what they measured. And they saw that the thickness was reduced. Thickness reduction can mean two things. One, either the, the neurons have become really slim. They would become slim before they die because they don't, they're not functioning correctly. They're losing their... Um, their volume inside their cell cells or sometimes they would just die so that is how this can reduce in size or volume okay Gold Country says, maybe a dumb question, but is vitamin D important for brain health too? So vitamin D is important for every tissue's health because it helps modulate the immune system and keeps it under balance. So most of these, these damages are occurring because of inflammations. So vitamin D's optimal levels would help reduce inflammation everywhere, control or optimize the inflammation. Vitamin C will be helpful for reactive oxygen species, which is also a part of the um, inflammatory process. So not a dumb question, good question. So uh, Natasha says, I thought my brain was wet, but doctor said I was crazy because the CT was clear. So the wetness is just a feeling right and it is possible that our, we can get paresthesia or abnorm abnormality in our feelings and that can occur for inflammation for inflammatory mark uh, molecules markers molecules going in the brain and so on on the other hand ct clear means that the brain tissue did not have any damage and that is a good thing <laughs> Siddhartha, you have very sharp ears. Yes, I just heard Luffy. So let me see if I can uh, bring Luffy upstairs. So give me one second. I'm going to go try to find him. Okay, Luffy just went out again. <laughs> Luffy is like the, the king of the house. He does what he wants. <laughs> August says, is that why my brain rattles? Um, oh, he seems to be back. Should I go try again? So... Uh, <coughs> Brain rattling is a feeling as well. Dr. Z says, it would be interesting to see comparison groups with people who got treatments like IV, monoclonal, steroids. Absolutely. I think Luffy may be here.
what do you think this is a mic this is a tablet so i give the uh, i give luffy a round of the house so i pick him up like this and i take him to various things and he sniffs them and he feels happy about them and enjoys them so he has become used to being in my arms and then trying to sniff around So, Dr. Z, yes, <laughs> it is Luffy. What happened, Luffy? He wants, he wants to go out. He has learned this behavior of meowing near a door to say, I want to go out. Yes, absolutely. So I still am curious if they can, the same researchers, can look at vaccinated status or the other drugs. V says Luffy is so pretty. Yes, he is. That is why it, it actually has gone to his head. <laughs> so uh, Lisa, Luffy is a Bengal. <laughs> yes, he started singing the songs of his people there that's true he now he's standing at the outside door and saying open this i want to go out denise mm -hmm. says silly luffy yep yep so, so the foods that can prevent from grave matter damage. So look, there are a few things that generally are important for brain health. One is the activity of the brain. So um, especially creative functions. The reason why creative functions are interesting and important is that... Um, if I can draw for a second, let me show. So our brain generally has scattered uh, neurons sitting in certain white matter tissue or bundles. And this is called reticular formation. Reticular formation is called reticular formation because it under the microscope, it looks like uh, dots of white and gray. So if I go here and I say reticular formation and let's go to Wikipedia. So <clears throat> see these areas where so that's not the reticular formation. This is not it. I have to go find reticular formation. I want to see a good one in bones here. Oh man, the, these are not the best diagrams for reticular formation. We need to go to images. Here. So this area is, for example, reticular formation. Reticular formation is nothing but the white matter and the gray matter interspersed with each other. But reticular formation makes a very important set of nuclei that are connected to something called a RAS, ascending reticular activating system. This is a system that activates the whole brain. So it has connections. So let's say if I make brain not anatomically correct because i'm trying to fit it in my page oh 
Okay, so this is the quite healthy and voluminous brain, high IQ brain. Okay, so here is a brain. And let's say <laughs> now the reticular formation should be somewhere over here. So in the brain stem, let's say there is some reticular formation. It is in many, many places. And this formation sends alert signals. It kind of turns on the lights in the whole brain. And I was listening to a study that was a person's research. If, uh, that was such an interesting research. What he said was, the idea of me, who am I? People uh, or neuro folks think that the me is this area of the brain, the frontal cortex and the cortex in general, and that is what defines personality. So that would mean, and I have that studies, uh, that video somewhere, that will mean that if the cortex is damaged or is not present, then the person cannot exhibit me like functions, me, myself, and then sense of pleasure or sadness of those. But they have patients who didn't have the cortex when they by birth. So they cannot really perform a lot of their functions because they don't have a cortex. In some patients, they had partial cortex because part of the cortex was removed. Even then, as long as the reticular formation was working, they exhibited the behaviors of happiness and sadness, although that is part of the limbic system. But it turned out the consciousness was living in reticular formation for this person uh, who was presenting this, uh, he's done research as a doctor on neuro things for his whole life. So he said the consciousness was actually sitting in the reticular formation. Now, what do I want to discuss? The limbic system, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere over here, thalamus, hypothalamus, subthalamus, limbic system, putamen, caudate, globus pallidus, uncus, amygdala, connection with the olfactory system, all of this together makes our brain's activity foundations. So when we are doing anything that has a, uh, a possibility of reward or punishment, then our brain gets activated, an active brain, which has chemicals being released and electrical activity happening. It allows the cells to keep themselves regenerated, keep themselves strong. Just like if you move more of your biceps muscles again and again, it would become thicker and the cells would accumulate more uh, nutrition in them and more mo uh, machinery to move and so on. They would become healthy and bigger. Similarly, brain cells become better and bigger as well if you activate them more. Now, the problem is if I say, well, just activate the olfactory system, now you're smelling things. But a general way is to do art because art does reward and punishment. You do good art, you become all happy. You do bad art, you become all upset. And similarly, art needs a lot of arousal. You have to be alert. You have to be drawing something. You have to be precise. You have to be observable, observing. So activating system plus the limbic system, they both get activated, which in turn activate every part of the brain. But not only that, when the brain is in active state, the motor cortex, when that is, for example, lit up with the cerebellum, I had not made a cerebellum here. So with the cerebellum, then what happens is that the, so this is cerebellum, this is motor cortex. Then what happens is that the signals that are going to the body, because brain is active, those signals are increased as well. Now, when the signals are increased, these signals are ending up on muscles, on all muscles of the body, other than the subconscious or the involuntary muscles. So when these muscles are receiving higher bombardment of electrical activity, they have increased tone. When they have increased tone, then two things happen. Number one, the muscle does not become atrophied or does not become wasted that fast. And number two, it can actually start accumulating nutrition. So it can stay healthy for longer. So just by doing art, we can get so much of the benefit. So that is one. 
Second is, of course, like fish oil or other lipid-based systems. Then um, the uh, reactive oxygen species neutralizing systems, they all help. But activity, especially art kind of activity, is very interesting. The other activities, for example, let's say you say, I want to play cricket. Great. Or I want to play tennis. But the thing is, you have already done a lot of activity of learning tennis. So now you just know it is kind of your muscle memory. Or it's really not a muscle memory. What really happens is, it is a plan in the basal ganglia, part of the brain, where basal ganglia has written down that if you are going to play tennis, then what is the way to play tennis? How to engage with the ball and how to approach it and how to hit it? And so when you're playing, the brain's motor area, the higher voluntary control area, that doesn't execute rapid bursts of movement like playing piano or playing tennis or playing sports because the voluntary system cannot keep control of such fast ballistic movements. So what it does is once you have learned how to execute a ballistic movement, then it is between the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. They both connect with each other to figure out that you're playing some game and they would just subconsciously from here send the signals down. Of course, the voluntary system is still there because it is saying, okay, I'm playing the game. Then I'm standing here. I want to hit the ball. You're not saying, okay, I'm going to throw the racket and go back. So that system has its own role, but the ballistic activity is all being done automatically. So that means not the whole brain is active unless you are learning. When you are learning, then you're saying, oh gosh, I missed it or I did it wrong or I did it right. That is what really keeps the brain healthy. Brain is not kept healthy with automated sort of muscle memory like things because they just use a part of the brain. But new things, the things that frustrate you, the things that make you happy, they are the ones that activate the brain. So the um, limbic system can look at everything in three ways. So imagine right now, you're listening to this talk. There are three, continuously, there are three assessments you are doing for everything you are hearing. Number one, meh, whatever. That's one possibility that inside your brain, your limbic system is saying, oh, whatever, I don't care for what he just said. Or it would say, oh, wow, this is really cool. I am amazed, I'm happy. Or fuck, <laughs> I don't, don't like what he said. I really hate it, right? So if it is meh, that I don't really care, then there is no reaction, no memory formed, no reaction formed, nothing. It's just dismissed. If you said, oh, wow, this is cool, then it will become a memory. Your brain would become active and you will become attentive as well. And it, that memory can repeat in your head and then it would become permanent as well. If you hated it, even then the brain would form a memory and make sure that in the future you know that you hate this. So anything that you do that brings pleasure or reward or punishment or frustration, they become, they alert your brain more than meh. So I hope that answers that. Yep. Eggs, coconut, oils, lipids, uh, less reactive oxygen species. Vitamins are important as well. So P. Lee J says, human interactions provide reward punishment. We've had two years of suppressed interaction. Can that atrophy our brain? That can, can impact the brain. I haven't seen any study that would say that it has negatively done it. But I was actually, this is so funny that you asked this question because I was thinking about that that if we do art, that arouses or causes the arousal of almost the whole brain tissue, including the reward and punishment feeling that normally we get when we interact with others. So it's still art is not a 
replacement for human interaction, positive or negative, but it still is very much up there for healthy brain. But very, I was actually thinking the same thing today. Absolutely, be ambidextrous. So yes, the point of, uh, I mean, you can, for example, have hobbies and things that you are very serious about and so you are very precise about. But then you can do things like, I do art. You are good or not good, but you're involved and you're doing things and you're learning. That process keeps brain healthy. But the things that you have learned, they become automated within the brain. So they have less to do with the arousal. You can do things all automated. You can go from your home to your office without thinking much about what you are doing. You're, you just know how to reach there. Yes, absolutely. So need to learn to do new things. And not that if once you've learned that thing, it has become kind of useless for the brain health anymore. Now you need to learn something new to do the new things because that process of learning keeps the brain healthy. So diversity love says muscle memory takes over when I play piano, but it's not supposed to. No, it is supposed to. That's how we work. So when you are playing piano, it is such a beautiful thing that how our brains work. So here is what happens. So when you're playing piano, learning in the beginning, <laughs> in the beginning. So let's say this is the brain. <laughs> this, this is some damaged. So let's say here. And then we have a basal ganglia here. And this part of the brain is motor cortex, motor. So not anatomically correct. So don't punish me for that. Motor cortex. You want to learn something. So piano, at some point in your life, you decided to learn piano. You sat down with a teacher or by yourself or whoever, and you started learning. The very first time your fingers were moving, brain would send, the motor cortex would send a deliberate action to the muscles, the fingers, and they will move. When they will move and press the keys, there is a specific, you know, the outcome that would happen. Now that outcome will be judged by you and by your teacher. And they would say good, bad, or mm -hmm, good, or whatever, nothing, right? If they say good, then your brain knows that whatever you just executed is something to record, something to keep that plan. If you said, if you or the teacher said bad, then brain also knows that this is something to change. So now you keep doing your activity again and again. And what is happening is in the basal ganglia, brain sends the command. So let's say it wants to move a finger. It's going to send that command to basal ganglia to say, hey, I'm going to move the fingers. Basal ganglia would send that to cerebellum to say, we are going to execute the plan to move the fingers. Can you please provide me the exact tonality of the muscles? Bas cerebellum sends that back. And now this command that came down is now modified by cerebellum inside the basal ganglia's area and then sent out. Now we get the feedback. The feedback is good, bad from teacher, you, then the visual feedback from auditory feedback. So we have so many sensory systems to give us feedback. That feedback would then tell the brain what to modify. Now the modification doesn't become here in the motor cortex. Motor cortex does not remember how to operate various things. It is the basal ganglia that acts like a librarian and the cerebellum that kind of tunes the tones and the, the velocities of movements and hardness of the movement or softness. So once you have learned, let's say, a song to be played, that song's memory will be kept here in the basal ganglia. Now in the future, if you want to play that again, 
motor cortex just has to tell the basal ganglia that, hey, execute this ballistic movement. And the basal ganglia and cerebellum would work with each other to produce that rhythm of moving hands and fingers, and you'll be playing the music. When that is happening, you have learned to do it in the past. There is not much reward or punishment attached with that. There's not much frustration attached with that. So there is not a lot of arousal. So it still is good. You still might feel happy after playing it, but it doesn't have that level of arousal that comes with trying to learn something. So the answer, it is supposed to do it. Um, when you play piano, it's the really the muscle memory is the memory inside the basal ganglia, the plan. If we cannot form a plan, we can never learn anything. So we are just a collection of plans that we learn throughout our life. But to keep brain healthy, we have to keep learning, not to accumulate more plans, but to give brain that hardship of being active and then saying, oh man, I need to be active, like I'm, I need to be a bodybuilder, I need to have my, my cells healthier. Yes, yes, very good, yes. So Catherine says, we've never had such a widespread epidemic and the resources to do so many brain scans how do we know that brain changes are not commonplace with other illnesses like influenza, for example? So the, for example, the biobank we're talking about, they keep getting images from people, they keep taking their histories to see what kind of an infection and so on. So there are actually studies in neurology space where they look at viruses and they look at other diseases, they look at the activities, and then they look at the brain's responses. There is a rich amount of study. It says that we, the cool beans, we have not exposed ourselves in the last two years towards neurology related studies. But there are tons of studies. Okay. So that is correct. The there are a couple of things to realize. So you what you said broken forever is correct. Our brain tends to find rewarding things and tends to avoid punishing things or those things that cause punishment or feeling of punishment. Rewarding is not just um, feeling good, but pleasure in many ways. In connection with this is memory. So when we see something that is bad, remember we it keeps coming back to us again and again, and that is our brain rehearsing to remember it. And then it becomes memory. An interesting thing with memory, and Dr. Z is here, I feel uh, bad that I am in her presence, I'm talking about these things. So Dr. Z, with due apology, if I overstep or present incorrectly. So memory, for example, <clears throat> let's say we have, I keep making weird brains. So let's say we have a brain here. Let's give it eyes. So it becomes not applicable for doctors. <laughs> so <laughs> here is a brain. In that brain, let's say you played a key, piano key. And that key produced a sound that you really loved. So the limbic area is going to like that 
to say, wow, and you would remember it. It would rehearse that again and again. So you might know that when we all know, when we are praised for something, we keep thinking about it. Similarly, when we are disrespected for something or we are criticized for something, we keep re remembering it. Sometimes for decades, we keep remembering it. And that is because our limbic system had associated that in memory as well with bad or with good. And memories are this interesting thing that, let's say this memory occurred when you played the key. But in the future, just looking at a piano without actually playing it can resurface that memory. So the memory connects various parts of the brain and a train is created that remembers that if you run an electrical pulse on that train, that would create or recreate the memory and the feeling with it. But the interesting thing about memory is you could recreate the train by connecting anywhere in that memory. For example, just by looking at piano, now you don't have to play it, but just by looking at it, you can remove, you can recall the memory of playing. So that is the interesting thing that the hooks into memory can be at any point and still reproduce the whole experience. <laughs> and Dr. Christine says, crap, I hope that you didn't take the jab. You appear as if you experience cognitive difficulties lately. Okay, so I did take the jab, both Moderna's, but I do not know if I have had cognitive difficulties. I have been a little distracted for some of the things, but that's about it. <laughs> the last of us is Pac-Man brain. Yep. So Marcia says we need to talk about ways to get good sleep. Dr. Z talked about sleep a few days ago. So if you look at the channel a few days ago, you would see a video with Dr. Z and I think I called it sleep issues or insomnia and solutions and she was tremendous she is tremendous to and discussed amazing helpful hints yes so brain size the, there is this study from uk oxford that showed that brain size, brain volume reduces globally plus cognitive decline occurs and they think it is because of the olfactory nerves involvement. Michelle says lion's mane. Yep, I like that um, painting that I did or illustration. So, X Hayashi says, is the recent study on how Pfizer vaccine DNA was found in liver cell study something that will occur in natural COVID infection as well? So that meaning if the spike protein is going to run around, it would happen with COVID or with vaccine both. Although this specific study was specifically for the DNA, for the liver cells. Patty Bond says, Moderna mRNA patent was found in the COVID virus, tiny chunks of DNA that matches. So could those long haul and brain problems be because of the Moderna patent being in the virus? So I discussed that, that Moderna's patent is present, but a patented string of uh, genetic material is present. But that, does that cause any brain issues? That would be a separate discussion. The only thing we know is that that causes uh, in the virus that allows the virus to be able to be primed. So viruses transmissibility is in part, it is supposed to be because of that furine cleavage site. 
But I think the brain issues are just in general SARS-CoV-2 related. Now, is that furin cleavage site something to do with that? I don't know. Kira says it's nice to read all of your comments. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so more questions. <laughs> ASW says, Dr. Bean, how do you know so much? You must have started when you were five years old. How can I gain this kind of comprehensive info at 72? So I just had to, this is medicine. So everyone has to learn medicine. So all doctors know this. Actually, they know more than me. I know a little less. Um, the doctors have to learn these things. It is PJ, it is possible. So the thing is, I don't have a study to kind of uh, say yes or say no. Kira Shrem says, since even mild COVID causes gray matter shrinkage, if someone experiences sudden cognitive decline, would you do T detector measure antibodies to see? Yes, it should be done. We should actually run these tests on almost everyone as a part of one physical. So after this pandemic, I think everyone in the world needs to have a physical and complete checkup. Um, Levingman says, can you please uh, attach the link? So I don't know where the, if I go here, Dr. Bean YouTube channel. Go to videos. Here it is, sleepless insomnia solutions. I'm gonna like my own video. <laughs> I always like my own videos. So, all right, let me paste that link over here. Done. So, back to the Pac-Man brain. So Med says, I have been suffering from brain fog for the past five months after Pfizer dose of Pfizer. So look at the iRecover protocol and there is actually help for this situation. So uh, there is help. Look at FLCCC. And there is a good news as well. Um, I and FLCCC are jointly going to present uh, long COVID studies and solutions. So they asked me to do some of this work about long COVID with them. And so I'll be starting from this week to do one talk from their platform about long COVID. Michelle says, I've been getting an experimental neurofeedback treatment called IASIS and it has helped my post COVID neuro issues, very good. I am sure that every stimulation would help make the brain healthy. And again, the point of stimulation is not a repeated learned behavior because that doesn't stimulate a lot. It is a new behavior that would frustrate you and make you happy and that is what does this. So not yet. So that was the interesting thing. I kept thinking in that study that it may have been easier for them to just ask about the vaccination status as well, but that is missing. So Dr. Z says, doing great, of course, because memory uses all scenes. Thank you very much. So yeah, that is, the, that is the wonderful thing that I feel about memory, that our memory might be built 
based on something sequential to say, I pressed a key on piano, pressed the key, then heard the sound and then felt great. And so it is now not necessary in the future to feel great by pressing the key only. You could just see the piano. So somewhere over here, you see the piano, sit down at the piano, at the piano, etc. So in the future, maybe just seeing the piano or just moving the key in the air, you might actually get a similar feeling because you can recall that memory. So to fish the memory out, you can actually hook it anywhere and pull it out. Colin says, given that fear is the most destructive emotion, could the fear porn of the past two years add to this brain issue? Now the current threat is adding to the fear factor too. I think so too. Uh, I believe Dr. Z is here. So uh, Dr. Z, if I'm, I am incorrectly paraphrasing you, please uh, uh, comment. But I think Dr. Z had mentioned it, that one of the um, reason for our depressions and is the fear and then continuous um, messaging that also like six feet and so on is like fear. So yes, fear is destructive. So DD says, how about moderate and severe? The shrinkage must be more than double. So they haven't given that data, but that would be interesting. So Butterfly Kiss says, so with FLCCC and Odyssey, yes. So I'll have to still figure out um, how to do it and where, but this week I'm going to do the first one. I think I'm going to do the same study that I just discussed today from FLCCC just to get us started. <laughs> Serenity says, do you know for scientific reason that my brain craves pistachio almonds after mental tasks? I'm not nuts. Uh, so maybe Dr. Z can tell that more uh, precisely. It may have been that somewhere in the past, you may have associated the mental tasks with these pistachios and almonds. Maybe you had kept them with you while doing the mental tasks. So brain kind of have learned to receive that as a reward. And so it says, now here is a mental task. I did what you wanted. Where is my reward? Maybe. <laughs> Dr. Z, tell me if I'm saying it correctly. So, call me says, so it, it's possible that significant damage occurred only in the vaccinated people, right? I don't know why would that be possible. And again, because they did not give the vaccinated status, it's actually not known who were vaccinated or not, but they gave the infected status. Hmm. Lee Log Galaxy says it may be the trauma of the pandemic. Yeah, possible. Cool. So I think this is where we are for today. Um,
<laughs> Parsila says, how about brain reduction after the jab? So there is no study yet. It should be there. We should look at that too. Cool. So thank you very much. Let's close for today. There is a link in the description that is to Dr. Bean premium account and the price is so low that it's almost, uh, it's almost like um, two lunches. <laughs> Dr. Z says you're not wrong spot on. Oh, thank you very much. Awesome. Good to know. So, um, So there is a link for that. Check it out. The, the premium content is actually good. It's not just me. There are, I think, another 10, 15 doctors whose lectures are there. And if you would like to support this channel separately as well, there is a link for buying me a coffee or becoming a patron or using PayPal. So thank you very much. And I would see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for now. And please like, subscribe, and share.